I welcome you to the Five Months Fellowship National Certificate that is part of the program on conflict transformation that is running from the month of July to the month of November. Today is on October 2nd in the year 2001, and uh, this is our part of the Fellowship National Certificate, which is a series that uh, we have fellows on, on the program who are not only uh, preparing uh, to become conflict transformation mediators, but also at the same time, they are developing themselves as um, mediators, as speakers, as we lead towards the uh, November 24 hour lead in summit to be hosted in the year 2021 on 19th and 20th of November. So for our session today on uh, October 2nd, on a Saturday, the year 2021, this is a session on advanced arbitration 101 skills with our mentor for this for the session that is uh, also fellowship coach Kishinga Dirango, who is an arbitration tutor. And we will start off with the words of the Kenyan national anthem, Wimbo Wataifa Kwa Luga Ya Kiswahili, and I will guide the first stanza. So wimbo wa taifa kwa lugha ya Kiswahili e Mungu nguvu yetu ilete baraka kwetu haki iwe ngao na mlinzi na tukae na undugu amani na uhuru raha tupate na ustawi Once again fellows and mediators I welcome you to our session on the second day of the month of October as I also welcome you to the great month of October, which is the fourth month to the Fellowship National Certificate that is ongoing for mediators in Kenya. The Fellowship Mentorship Session is a series that is part of the Women's Edge, a skills mentorship uh, uh, session that is running as part of the Fellowship uh, Program. So today we have our Fellowship Coach and also the mentor for this session, Kishinga Dirango, who is an arbitration tutor, and he will be taking us through the session today. Gishinga Dirango, how are you today? And thank you for joining us. I'm very fine, Wangare. Karibu sana. This is uh, your session. We are looking forward to be able to get um, advanced uh, one on one skills in arbitration as part of enhancing the capacity of mediators as uh, conflict transformation professionals. So Karibu Sana and yeah, please uh, do carry on for the uh, skills mentorship hour. Thank you for joining us. Okay, thank you uh, very much Wangare. And uh, I'll request that uh, you'll be guiding me. Will there be a break in between? We, we will have a five minutes break at uh, 8.25. So okay. as the time gets on, yes, I will uh, let you know. Thank you for inquiring. Okay, okay. Yes. thank you so much. Uh, and once again, uh, uh, I want to thank you for having invited me to be part of this particular session. And obviously, I believe that uh, the session that we are having today builds upon the earlier session that we had uh, that uh, was basically an introduction or an introductory session on uh, arbitration. Uh, I am obviously uh, very aware that uh, amongst the participants are some, uh, some of the people who are also skilled and have a very uh, deep understanding of uh, arbitration on this call. And therefore I feel that uh, I'm not alone as I present, but uh, I'm also aware that uh, maybe some of the issues we'll be discussing might also be issues that are fairly new to a number of people who probably would like to take an interest or to pursue some interest in this particular area. And therefore, again, uh, the needs uh, of these people is basically to understand more about arbitration and how it runs and uh, obviously maybe to heat up their appetite for arbitration within the overall schematic uh, architecture of uh, uh, conflict mediation, alternative dispute resolution, 
and uh, I hope therefore the session <clears throat> will uh, be useful to all the people who are in this session. Now, uh, this session has been called Arbitration 101. Uh, my understanding therefore being that we are basically just trying to explain how an actual mediation maybe runs, what are some of the uh, critical or key issues to bear in mind, and also uh, to, uh, to explore a bit more what is actually the relationship between arbitration and uh, mediation, because each of these are actually forms of alternative dispute resolution. So to get us uh, started, <clears throat> I will uh, obviously uh, begin with, uh, with the first uh, uh, phase, basically just to explain that uh, in terms of procedure or the way arbitration runs, there are a number of uh, phases or a number of steps, procedures that uh, are taken into consideration. The first is basically what we call the interlocutory phase of uh, arbitration proceedings. Then after this interlocutory phase, we have uh, the hearing, uh, and consideration of the evidence. So hearing in case we shall have an oral presentation of the evidence where witnesses will come and uh, provide evidence to the tribunal because uh, once arbitration begins, that whole setup is called a tribunal. In the same way you have the court, the arbitration is called a tribunal. So the tribunal of course is made up of the arbitrator and uh, the parties who, who are there. But now the arbitrator, preside, the arbitrator presides over a tribunal. So there's a hearing in terms of uh, the oral evidence where witnesses can come and present. Alternatively, parties can choose that they will not want to present oral evidence, in which case they might want that the arbitrator relies on whatever documents they have presented to him which are usually called pleadings. So basically they set out the key issues in terms of their case or their defense to the tribunal to consider and any other key documents that they consider are important uh, to be considered in arriving uh, at a decision in that particular matter. So uh, that can also just be one of the second ways in which an arbitration can be conducted. And then of course, uh, the final stage is always that uh, at the end of everything, the arbitrator is expected to publish his award. Now, in terms of the first stage, which is the interlocutory stage, it is important to note that uh, at this point, the arbitrator really has no idea or really doesn't necessarily know what really is the essence of the case between the parties. The, the farthest the arbitrator will probably have known is that there is a dispute and that the parties would want to submit this particular dispute to arbitration. But as to the substance of the matters that the arbitrator is supposed to consider, it is usually the case that the arbitrator really is also here with an open mind and uh, is just expected to understand what the parties uh, wish to present to him. Now, the first thing, therefore, is that he convenes what is called a preliminary meeting. The preliminary meeting is the first point at which the arbitrator gets to know the parties or to meet with the parties. And uh, the understanding is that all parties will be present at the preliminary meeting. Sometimes it does happen that uh, one of the parties, usually the one who has been taken to the arbitration as a, a defendant or what is called the respondent, uh, a lot of the times they would be very hesitant to attend the preliminary meeting because probably they are not in agreement with uh, the matter being taken to, uh, to arbitration or they are not willing to cooperate with the tribunal. So at the preliminary meeting, the arbitrator must proceed with the preliminary meeting if there's a, a confirmation of his invitation to the meeting, 
even if only one party confirms that they are available for the meeting. The arbitrator should only consider if there has been an objection in terms of maybe the date, time, maybe even the place or the forum through which this meeting is to be conducted. Maybe uh, there has been a suggestion, maybe because of the COVID restrictions to have a virtual meeting, but maybe one of the parties actually would like and physical meeting maybe, for example. If there is such objection, the arbitrator must uh, address those issues and find a middle ground that accommodates the interest of all the parties. But if there has been no such communication and maybe a party just ignores to attend the meeting, the arbitrator must proceed with the preliminary meeting. So during the preliminary meeting, a number of issues would usually be discussed. But maybe uh, the most important issues is that first, the arbitrator must actually confirm that there is a dispute in existence. The important thing about this is that it is actually possible that maybe before, from the time the parties reported a dispute, to the time the, uh, the uh, preliminary meeting is convened, it is actually possible that the parties could have talked and agreed to, uh, you know, to resolve their dispute or to find uh, a means of addressing the issues that probably were leading them to arbitration. So the arbitrator must confirm there's a, there's a dispute because his ability to preside over a tribunal or what is called the jurisdiction of the tribunal of the arbitrator is actually based on a dispute that exists and for which the parties have agreed to submit themselves to an arbitral process. Then the other thing is that the arbitrator must confirm the representation of the parties. So in terms of representation of the parties, the parties are at liberty to either uh, represent themselves or be represented by counsel or by advocate. So that's the other issue that the arbitrator must confirm how the parties wish to address or approach the tribunal. Will it be in their individual capacities or will it be through their advocates? The other issue, of course, is on the venue of the proceedings. The important thing here is that uh, in view of the COVID-19 restrictions, uh, a lot of uh, matters now, whether this matter has been court or even now in arbitration or even in mediation, are being conducted virtually. So it is important to confirm how do the parties wish their matter resolved? Do they want to actually have physical hearings or would they want to have their matter resolved virtually through virtual hearings? So again, that is confirmed. And then the other important element is on the terms of uh, payment for the arbitrator. Remember in arbitration, unlike in court, the parties themselves are responsible for paying the arbitrator and meeting the costs of the arbitration. So for example, if uh, there is a, a, a physical venue to be procured for purposes of the hearing, it is the parties who pay for that because that's a cost of the arbitration. Uh, if maybe they would need um, uh, someone to be taking notes, uh, a stenographer, uh, of all the sessions, again, that is a cost that the parties must meet. And then, of course, the arbitrator himself has to be paid, and an arbitrator is usually paid on an hourly basis. Uh, if, uh, if the arbitration is uh, being conducted through, uh, let's say, the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, then the, the institute has its own schedule. Uh, otherwise, uh, the, the, the parties and the arbitrator can agree on whatever uh, payment uh, is agreeable to them. And then uh, uh, the, the parties then will agree, of course, on how the, 
the sessions will be scheduled. Uh, and uh, once that is agreed upon, then uh, they, they, they find the best way in which that will be, will be handled. And then they could also agree on issues like are there expenses that can be reimbursed? For example, if maybe there's a need to do certain photocopies, for example, how will those costs be reimbursed if the arbitrator incurs those costs? If the arbitrator has, for example, maybe to travel to the venue, maybe for purposes of taking evidence, maybe it's, a, it's something like maybe to do with maybe a construction and maybe the arbitrator needs to ascertain certain things. If he travels to that particular venue, again, there will always be a question about how uh, those expenses will be reimbursed. So all these issues will be discussed at the interlocutory stage so that uh, all the parties are on a similar understanding on all the relevant issues. Then in terms of this stage, the most important thing would usually be that uh, the parties will agree on uh, a number of issues around how they will present their claims or their defenses to whatever claims are made before the tribunal. So that therefore the tribunal has a broad understanding on both parties' case before it, so that it can be able to make a determination that takes into consideration all the issues that have been brought before it. So the starting point is usually that the party who has a complaint, is usually called the complainant, uh, would have a statement of claim. The statement of claim would usually just indicate what is his case, what is his complaint, what has he lost, and therefore what is he demanding. So that is a statement of claim. And then the other party who has to respond to that claim, who is called a respondent in arbitration, then has to file their statement of defense to the claim made by the claimant. And then what the arbitrator will do is that he will give timelines within which uh, the claimant has to table their statement of claim and the respondent has to uh, give their statement of defense. Usually uh, the defendant will have on average around 21 days from the day in which the statement of claim is made, but of course it can even be 14 days or shorter. And then uh, once the respondent uh, brings his statement of defense, then the claimant is entitled to make a response or a reply to that statement of defense. The idea being that uh, once uh, someone makes a, a defense, uh, it is the first, chance or the first opportunity that actually the claimants get to understand the respondent's case. That is his defense because that's also his case. So he also, the claimant therefore has a right to reply to the case presented by the respondent. And then obviously once all this uh, are done, uh, then there is of course uh, uh, the the, the witness statements, uh, because once you, you, you state your claim, you'll probably want to provide further evidence by way of st witness statements. So uh, the parties are also free to file any witness statements that they have before the tribunal. And then uh, um, over and above that, there might be other uh, issues that they might want that they might want to present to the tribunal. So, so uh, once that is done, uh, the, 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 the matter then moves to uh, the parties uh, getting ready and presenting their evidence to the tribunal. Once uh, the issues about presentation of uh, the party's case, just one minute, I just want to switch off a phone that is here. Yeah, so once the parties have uh, uh, presented all their various pleadings, which are called um, evidence proofs of their cases, 
then the hearing would usually proceed. The hearing could actually be an oral hearing, and I'll be talking about that later, or it could be a hearing based on, uh, on the facts that are presented to the tribunal. So based on that presentation of the evidence, then the parties would be invited subsequently to, they would be invited subsequently to make their closing submissions. And the closing submissions basically would be um, an outline of the facts, the key facts that they have presented or that they would want the tribunal to take it to consideration in making its determination on the case and any legal authorities that they might wish to cite in furtherance or uh, in support of uh, their case or the issues that they have set before the tribunal. So once, once, uh, once, uh, once the, 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 the parties have presented their case, then uh, the tribunal retires to consider the case that has been presented by each of the parties and um, it then renders its decision in the matter. Uh, and in arbitration, uh, the decision is called an award. In court, of course, we know that it's a judgment. It's important to note that when the arbitrator presides over a tribunal, he has the same authority or the same ranking as a judge of the high court. And for this reason, therefore, once his award is issued, the award is uh, registered at the high court and it is actually now enforced in the same way like a judgment of the high court. In the same way, of course, then that means that a party who is dissatisfied with uh, the arbitrator's um, uh, finding or the award can be able to lodge an appeal or can appeal against that particular decision. But the important thing is that to be able to appeal, the parties must have agreed that the award to be issued by the arbitrator is what we call a reasoned award or an award with reasons. Uh, and we shall be seeing that in fact, it's possible for parties to say that they do not want the arbitrator to provide reasons for his findings in which case, therefore, the parties also lose a right to appeal. Then uh, the important thing to note, of course, is that the decision of the arbitrator must be in writing uh, so that uh, it's uh, on record in the same way that the courts are called, our courts are called courts of record in the sense that whatever they decide is always put in writing the arbitration decision therefore must also be in writing and it must be available to all the parties. Now, the question about availability to all the parties is an important one because remember the arbitrator is paid by the parties or rather the parties are responsible for paying the fees of the arbitrator. And the arbitrator is entitled to, with, to withhold his award if the parties fail to pay his fees or if any one party fails to pay their part of the fees, the arbitrator is entitled to withhold his uh, award until he receives payment in full. So the question about availing to all the parties is actually dependent on the parties meeting their costs in terms of the fees due to the arbitrator. And therefore, uh, a party, what party can decide to pay all the fees that are due to the arbitrator and uh, then seek a contribution from the other party or enforce it through the court, the normal court process to be paid for any money that is owed to him by the other party on account of having paid the arbitrator's fee. So that's important to bear in mind. So that is essentially what would uh, be included in the interlocutory uh, phase. And then um, uh, there are other important elements now that I would like to look at 
and uh, that relates, which of course relates to the interlocutory phase, but on the question about witnesses, like how does the tribunal itself receive evidence? And uh, at this stage, I'd just like to confirm with Angari, how is our time so that I... Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, Gishinga, thank you very much for uh, that uh, part that uh, we have been able to cover, the interlocutory stage, and uh, as we come on to the witnesses, would you like to cover the witnesses section so that we finish the stage one, and then we can have the break? Gishinga? Hello, Wangari, I lost you. You're saying I cover the witnesses stage, yeah? Yes, yes, please cover it and then we okay, can have, no uh, yes, the, the break. Yeah? Thank you. Okay, okay, that's fine. Okay, so, so uh, as I said in the interlocutory st uh, stage, it is possible that uh, parties are uh, present their witness statements. They are entitled to present their witness statements in support of their cases, in support of the case that they have before the tribunal in terms of the claim they're making or the defense that they are presenting to the claim. So uh, each party therefore can call witnesses. And the first stage is usually that they will uh, have sworn witness statements presented to the tribunal. Then a party can actually choose that it does not wish to call the witnesses in person, but that, that instead they will rely purely on the witness statements that have been submitted to the tribunal. So that is a choice the parties have. The witness statement, uh, if it's not presented orally before the tribunal means that uh, the parties only, the tribunal only has whatever facts have been stated in the witness statements, but those facts have not been tested through cross-examination. So if anything is unclear, probably the tribunal uh, is denied the opportunity to better understand maybe the full extent of the issues uh, that are being conversed by a particular party. Uh, the most common thing is usually that witnesses might decide that over and above uh, the witness statements, they might want the witnesses themselves to be called to present oral evidence, which gives them a better opportunity to explain in greater detail the issues that are set out in their witness statement. So the important thing to note is that once a witness avails himself to provide oral evidence, then that witness is subjected to first an examination in chief. Examination in chief being that the, wit the party that called the witness, in this case, uh, uh, if it's a claimant, uh, for example, his counsel or his advocate is entitled then to actually run him through his witness statement so that uh, he, in a sense, he explains each aspect of the witness statement or what is contained the, in the witness statement. And then the other party would then be entitled to actually cross-examine this witness on the issues that he has alleged in that particular witness statement. And the idea of course of cross-examination would be maybe to point out maybe weaknesses or inconsistencies or inaccuracies that uh, exist in that uh, witness statement and which would be important for the tribunal to take note of in uh, making its determination. And then of course, after the cross-examination, there would obviously be a re-examination by the party who had called that particular witness so that that witness can clarify issues that might have arisen in the course of the cross-examination, so that again, its case still remains strong. The arbitrator himself or herself is entitled to uh, pose questions to the witness on any element of his evidence or her evidence that was not uh, clear or that needs further elaboration, but usually this is after the re-examination because the arbitrator must provide as much opportunity as possible for the witnesses to provide their evidence before the tribunal with the list of interruption. So he'd probably make note 
of any issues that uh, might need further elaboration. And then he will wait for this uh, right at the end, and then he can pose his questions. But of course, he can also ask at any point, but it's considered best that this is done at the very end. Then it is important to remember that just like happens in court, witnesses take an oath to tell the truth. So they are usually sworn in accordance with their own faith. But of course, witnesses can also uh, uh, give unsworn evidence, just like also happens in court. So you can swear with the Bible, the Quran, or any other book of faith, but you can also just give unsworn evidence. It's allowed. Then, uh, an important point that I wanted to uh, really explain is that uh, apart from the normal witnesses who would be called upon, there are certain situations where uh, it is important to get an expert to provide evidence. Because maybe it is a matter that deals maybe like with the construction, maybe a building collapsed, and you're trying to find who really should bear the cost of you know the loss that arose out of the collapse of that building, for example. That's a technical issue, mm -hmm. and it probably requires an expert in that field. Um, it could be maybe issues around accounts. Maybe there are there are, there are issues around uh, uh, monies in terms of the accounting, or of uh, maybe certain costs, certain expenses, and uh, in that case, you might probably want to call an expert witness who can really uh, dissect the accounts, explain them, and uh, maybe uh, explain his own finding about what he thinks uh, maybe where the problem is. So these are usually called expert witnesses. Witnesses who are called for the purpose of uh, assisting the tribunal to make its determination through the use of, of their own expertise in a particular field. Expert witnesses, uh, uh, before they're appointed, uh, an application is made to the tribunal and the tribunal consents to an expert witness. So it's not just like a witness, someone just comes up and also just gives a, a witness uh, statement, for example, but the tribunal is usually informed that we intend to call an expert witness to explain the following issues or to to assist the tribunal on the following issues. And uh, parties sometimes will agree uh, that each of the parties will call their own expert witness. And then the, the expert witnesses will probably then work together and could come up with a report on the issues and agree, do they have a common understanding of the issues? So the expert witness, the important thing to understand is that the expert witness is not an advocate and he must never play the advocate's role. Remember, the role of the advocate is actually <clears throat> to present and prosecute the case of a particular party. So by nature, the advocate is partisan. The advocate is not there to help the other party present its case. The advocate is only there to help present the case of the party that has appointed it. So for that reason, the advocate obviously can be partisan or can take sides uh, in advancing the case of his clients, but an expert cannot. An expert cannot take sides. An expert must remain neutral, neutral in the sense that his only obligation is to look at the facts and help the tribunal understand the facts of uh, the particular issue that has been appointed as an expert. And it is important to note that even where an expert has been appointed by a specific party, his role is actually to the tribunal, to assist the tribunal. His role is not to advance the case of uh, the party who is alleging maybe a building collapse because of the following reasons or this reason, and therefore to make sure that his report uh, will uh, be geared towards reinforcing that particular argument. As an expert, his role is actually to make a finding and to advise the tribunal that in fact, the collapse of this building was as a result of X, Y, Z, 
and not ABC. So that's the role of the expert. Therefore, one of the important things is that an expert witness must be impartial in the issues that he's investigating. And, and uh, he must use his knowledge and experience to bear on the interpretation that he will put to the facts and other data that is brought to his attention. In other words, the way he can assist the tribunal is by making use of his knowledge and experience to help the tribunal come to a fair determination of the matter. So that is really what the expert witness is expected to do. Now, if an expert witness fails to understand the role that is supposed to be playing before the tribunal and ends up, for example, being partisan, uh, being uh, a partisan, not being impartial, and therefore taking sides, the risk is that uh, his evidence can be discredited as worthless because then he's really of no evidential value to the tribunal since his only role is to help the tribunal understand the facts but not to take sides and uh, advance the case of a party. Remember, I said at the beginning that an expert witness is not an advocate. So his role is not to be partisan. His role is just to state the facts as they are and to use his knowledge and experience to explain those facts. So the point there is that the expert witness can only interpret data uh, or other information in support of or against a party's position. He can, his work is just to interpret the information, but he cannot argue that particular uh, party's case. So <clears throat> situations happen, as I said, where uh, each party brings an expert. So for example, maybe this party brings an accountant and this party brings an accountant. The ideal situation is that each of these parties will conduct their own uh, independent uh, analysis of the issues. And then they're supposed to come together, being experts, and see whether they can come to a common understanding. The idea is that since they're dealing with facts, it should be possible for them to actually come to a common understanding. So in that case, they will uh, present like a common position to the tribunal. But uh, the understanding is that uh, <clears throat> being experts, there should be no agreement about the basic facts of the matter before them, the processes that relate to that, and even the results. It's just like even as we usually see, very common when it comes to things like uh, conduct of postmortem in criminal matters where people have passed on, you'd usually find that the family would appoint its own you know, uh, expert, I mean, its own uh, 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 whatever doctor, uh, I don't know, what is it called? The one who conducts postmortem, I'm forgetting. And then the other party would also have their own uh, person. And the idea is that they conduct that postmortem together and they usually come to a common understanding that yes, the cause of death was a heart attack, for example, because the facts themselves would tell you that you know, the, what their findings are consistent with a heart attack. So it's the same way that experts should also work, that they should be able to agree on the basic facts, and therefore even the results, they should be able to come to a common understanding on the results, uh, and therefore the uh, report that they present. Uh, it's important to note that uh, differences may arise in terms of interpretation, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the results that uh, they analyze. So that, for example, maybe if it's a building that collapsed, they could agree, yes, uh, uh, the collapse uh, was, uh, you know, the, 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 the following issues were there. Maybe there wasn't enough cement. Maybe uh, the, the mixing was not right. So they could, they could agree on certain common things. But maybe uh, in terms of the final reason for the collapse, they might disagree. They might say that, in fact, even with all these, the building should still have withstood 
uh, maybe it was more that it was rushed, maybe it didn't take the number of days that were required for a certain process to complete. So they could have maybe on a certain element, a difference in terms of the interpretation, which then means the tribunal then must make its own determination based on that. But those kind of cases should be very limited. That's the understanding of expert witnesses. So um, uh, I think I will stop at that and uh, then allow uh, Wangari to guide uh, in terms of the break. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, thank, thank you very much, uh, Gishinga, for that uh, section where we've been able to go through the interlocutory stage and also um, uh, get a very good understanding of the witnesses and, uh, uh, and including also the expert witnesses. So colleagues, we will have a five minutes break and uh, that means that we will be back uh, on the session uh, at, exa at exactly 8.55 a.m. to go on with part two. So please have uh, at, uh, an opportunity to uh, refill your glass and uh, let's be back at five minutes to 9 a.m. Karibu. So welcome back to welcome back uh, to part two of uh, our mentorship uh, session today on advanced arbitration skills 101 with uh, fellowship coach and uh, the session mentor Gishinga Dirango, who is an arbitration tutor. This is our Saturday session on the second day in the month of October in the year 2021 as part of the fellowship national certificate for mediators in Kenya that is going on for five months from the month of July to November. So Karibu Sana, uh, back over to you. 
uh, for uh, the continuation with uh, the session. Back over to you, Gishinga. Karibu. Thank you, Angari, for the invitation and uh, welcome. welcome back Karibu. to everyone. Um, and uh, we are now uh, going to the last part of our session. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, it should be, uh, I, I hope that uh, we'll be able to proceed well. Uh, so basically under this section, I'm looking, uh, I'll be looking at uh, after everything is done, the judgment of the tribunal is usually called an award as we have already seen. And uh, it is important to understand what kind of award can an arbitrator make? Because the type of award also becomes very important eh, in terms of what happens after the award has been issued. So um, the first point before we get to the types of award is that uh, it is important to note that the award, the arbitrator must publish his award. And publishing means that it must meet certain criteria for example, the award must be signed. An award that is not signed uh, would not be treated as a final award because it's not signed. Uh, then the award is, itself must also uh, be able to state the seat of arbitration. So for example, if it's a award that happened here in Kenya, ordinarily, or in most cases, the award would state the seat as, for example, the seat is Nairobi, for instance. Uh, the seat becomes important because it would determine the law that would apply in case, for example, there is an appeal or even in terms of enforcement. Uh, and therefore, the seat would be determined by under what law was that arbitration carried out, which therefore means that uh, it is possible to also then have an arbitration being conducted in Nairobi but the seat of the arbitration is not Nairobi because maybe, maybe the, the, the agreement between the parties had already chosen that the seat of arbitration, for example, would be a London or it could be Ireland or it could be Singapore, which therefore means even if the dispute is being arbitrated in Nairobi, the seat of arbitration will not be Nairobi, would actually be in accordance with what the parties had agreed that in case of a dispute, we'll want the seat to be in London, which then means that even the applicable law around enforcement, around appeal, would actually be the law as applied in the UK. So that becomes very important to know what is the seat of the arbitration. Now, in arbitration, it is important to note that arbitration is a consensual process. Is that it is who are in trouble. And uh, for that reason, uh, how the parties de decide how the arbitration will run becomes uh, important because they also have a say on what kind of uh, award they'll want the arbitrator to issue at the end of the arbitration. So what then that means is that the parties can agree that once we have presented all the facts in the arbitration, we'll want the arbitrator to issue this kind of award. And there are different kinds of awards. The first one, which is probably the most common, is what you call an award with reasons or a reasoned award. A reasoned award is an award where the arbitrator looks at the facts that were presented before him. He looks at the specific issues that the party, that the parties invited him to, to uh, address. And actually I did forget to mention about issues that at the interlocutory stage, the parties would usually uh, state what are the specific issues that we want the arbitrator to make a finding or a determination on 
and uh, to be able then to make a finding on those particular issues. This can agree on one set of issues, but where they fail to agree on a common set of issues, each of the party can table to the arbitrator their proposed list of issues, and then it is up to the arbitrator to make a finding on all the issues that have been presented to him by both parties. So when it comes to the reasoned award, the award therefore would base his findings on a finding or a determination on each of the issues that the parties invited him. For example, the, one of the issues could be, was there a breach of contract? The parties actually want to know, was there a breach of contract? So the arbitrator has to find out whether or not there was actually a breach of contract. And if he finds that there's a breach of contract, he has to identify why was there a breach of contract. So he'll probably say, party A uh, made a payment towards the purchase of the house uh, as agreed under their contract, but party B failed to deliver the house. So for example, that is a determination on that particular issue. So an award with reasons is one which therefore provides the reasons why he makes a finding, for example, that there was a breach of contract. Then the parties can also decide that they actually don't want to be told what the reasons are. They have a dispute. All what they want the, uh, the arbitrator to do is to make a finding uh, because they do not want to proceed with a possible appeal on what the arbitrator decides. Because remember, uh, the only uh, time you'll be able to approach the court in an appeal if you're dissatisfied with the arbitrator's finding is if you have uh, uh, the, the reasons, you have the reasons why the arbitrator, the arbitrator made certain decisions, you are dissatisfied with those reasons, and you therefore approach the tribunal, uh, I mean the court, the high court, to overturn that particular decision. Then you'd have to state in your appeal the reasons why you disagree with that, and it is now for the court to decide whether indeed those could be reasons to overturn the award. So that's why a reason award becomes important. So the parties, as I said, can then decide that they do not want reasons, they just want a finding. So for example, if it was a sale agreement for the purchase of house, for example, they just want to find out, was there a breach of contract? Party A paid this amount, party B did not deliver the house. Was there a breach? They do not want to know the reasons why the arbitrator decides there was breach or there was no breach. They just want the arbitrator to tell us, having looked at the facts, was there a breach, yes or no? But do not give us the reasons because we'll basically be satisfied with your determination on that issue and therefore we'll be able to base our next steps on purely just what you, dist you determine. Then it can also happen that in the course of the arbitration, parties actually uh, get to a stage where they actually agree and they had a dispute before them and they come to some form of accommodation between themselves and enter into an agreement and they said, no, we are fine. We can actually consent. We can agree to end this arbitration on the following terms. We have agreed party A, will finish their uh, uh, outstanding payment of so much and party B will deliver the house, for example. So in that case, they will, they will agree on the terms on which they have consented, basically to end the arbitration. And once they agree on that consent, uh, then the arbitrator then must issue a consent award because the process had begun. So he issues a consent award on the terms that were agreed by the parties. The other issue is that uh, sometimes the parties can, in the course of the proceedings, can actually invite the arbitrator to, to make what we call an interim award. An interim award is that even as the, the matter is continuing, the party might actually want the arbitrator to make a determination on certain issues, even before the final award is issued. 
So that is usually called an interim or preliminary award. And it could be on any issues. For example, the parties might invite the arbitrator say, one party might say, no, 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 as far as we are concerned, you actually do not have authority uh, as per the contract that we signed for this matter to be before the tribunal. So for example, they can say, the tribunal has no jurisdiction to entertain this matter. Or you do not have the power or the jurisdiction to entertain matter B and C as has been uh, presented as an issue for the tribunal to determine. So the arbitrator can actually decide to make a finding on that specific issue, even as the arbitration is continuing. He can say, okay, on this issue about uh, objection to B and C, I will make a determination on that particular issue. That is usually called an interim or preliminary award because it is a finding of the tribunal on a specific issues and the tribunal usually give reasons why it made a certain determination. But then an interim or preliminary award does not stop the continuation of the arbitration. The, tri the arbitration continues and at the very end of it, the arbitrator will issue what is called a final award. A final award, uh, just as the name suggests, is a final determination on all the issues that were presented before the tribunal. Then the next issue that I wanted to cover, uh, taking into consideration that a lot of the people, obviously on this, uh, people who are involved in mediation, is maybe to actually find, is there a connection between mediation and arbitration? Is there a point of confluence or convergence between <clears throat> these two mechanisms of resolving disputes through the alternative dispute resolution route? So let me just therefore just explain briefly about these two so that we find in what ways can these two merge or how do they relate? And why is it important to understand this relationship? So mediation, of course, as we know, <coughs> involves uh, the intervention that is made by a third party professional, who is of course the mediator, to essentially act as a facilitator and assist the parties reach their own agreement. And I think the bottom line there is that it is their own agreement. The parties ag actually agree on, by, on their own the role of a mediator is purely to facilitate that particular agreement. So what essentially the mediator therefore does is just to find some common ground uh, between the parties. And uh, the mediator supports them to find a settlement on all the issues. So he's, he's more of a go between to help the parties find some common ground so that they can arrive at a final settlement on all the issues that uh, they are conflicting about. On the other hand, of course, an uh, arbitration is also a means of resolving disputes. But in arbitration, the arbitrator actually acts as a judge and makes the final decision. And in mediation, actually, what agreed upon is the decision of the parties themselves. Now, the point to note is that the arbitration, an arbitration can be conducted on the basis of a oral, oral hearing. Remember we said the parties can present their witness statements, they can present oral evidence before the tribunal, and then the tribunal basically then makes a determination on the basis of the totality of all the evidence that was presented before it. Alternatively also, the parties can actually decide, no, we do not want to appear before the tribunal in terms of oral presentations will provide the tribunal with all the relevant documents and let it make its own determination uh, on the basis just of reviewing the documents that we have presented before it. Let's say the contracts, receipts of payments, whatever other documents we have. But remember, mediation actually involves a personal interaction because you're facilitating the parties, you have maybe breakout sessions for the parties, to find, to try and find some middle ground, some accommodation to each other. So therefore, unlike arbitration, 
which can just be on the base of documents and the arbitrator probably even never meets the parties in uh, mediation the, the, the that interaction becomes uh, becomes uh, important then uh, the other issue to note is that uh, the other issue to note is that in fact in terms of the link between mediation and arbitration is that it is possible for a matter to begin as mediation and then end up as an arbitration. So for example, parties could have, end, could have decided that we want to mediate our dispute. But along the lines, it actually becomes no. Mediation is probably not the most uh, pragmatic way in which this matter can be resolved because maybe of the extent of the issues involved, maybe the rights that needs to be secured between the parties. And therefore they say maybe arbitration might be the better way to address these issues conclusively. In which case, that matter mutates from a mediation to an arbitration. So the forum of dispute resolution changes. Uh, when that happens, of course, it is important that there is agreement between the parties, uh, either that in the initial issue that uh, had brought this conflict, there was an arbitration clause, or the parties enter into an agreement consenting to arbitration. So that's what uh, would be required so that then the arbitrator has, a, has a, the jurisdiction or the power to entertain that particular issue. Then, then uh, the other issue is that a matter can also commence as uh, an arbitration, but then the parties elect to mediate. So, if uh, parties decide to mediate, then a mediator will be appointed. So again, this is a situation where the matter began as an arbitration, but the parties feel maybe to maintain our relations. Remember, arbitration is uh, an adversarial process. Adversarial in the, in the sense that it is a win-lose outcome. Uh, one party will win, one party will lose. It's not a, uh, like mediation where you are really working on a win-win situation where each party feels that they've been accommodated uh, in the sense that they have come to a common agreement and they own the decision. In arbitration really is the arbitrator making that the decision and he's not there to facilitate the parties to a certain outcome. So uh, if um, uh, parties uh, get into an arbitration, they might then find that no, in terms of the matters between us and maybe to maintain future relations and future links between us would then prefer to mediate the dispute, in which case a mediator will then be appointed. Remember that uh, the issues that will have been conversed in arbitration could, for example, have, been, have involved maybe in the course of the defense that is given or the, the, the witness statements that were provided Parties might, for example, have admitted to certain things. So, for example, they might have admitted, yes, I was not wrong on this, or I own, I take responsibility for X, Y, Z. But remember that once you move to mediation, the idea is to ensure that you facilitate a conversation. For, for, for that reason, a mediator who is appointed on that matter should therefore not, for example, seek to use whatever evidence had been agreed upon or discussed uh, in the earlier arbitration as a basis for whatever finding, uh, the, I mean, the finding that comes out of the mediation process in terms of the final settlement, that really is not supposed to influence the, the, the mediation process. So that becomes important that these two processes must be distinct, must be separate, must be independent, so that the mediator is better able to facilitate the uh, agreement on some settlement between the parties in the mediation proceedings. Now, it is important to always remember that in both mediation and in arbitration, the mediator, the arbitrator has no rule. They indicated has rule, sorry has no rule, has no rule 
to provide legal advice to the parties. So your, your, your role as a mediator is basically to facilitate by the parties own the decision. Your role as an arbitrator is to provide an opportunity for the parties to converse and present their case. But it is not for you to tell them, to provide legal advice to them that, oh, no, 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 I think on this one you should have done this. I think you should have presented your claim in this manner. I think you should be uh, aware that uh, legally you cannot say this or that. No, that's not your role. You are supposed to be independent. You're supposed to be impartial. And therefore, you're not supposed to take a partisan position on the matters that the parties present before you. You should leave that particular role to the respective counsel or advocates of the parties who are before you. So uh, that's where I would like to end, uh, just in terms of therefore that uh, analysis of uh, the way these two processes begin. I think the bottom line is to note that it is possible for a matter to begin as a mediation and end up as an arbitration. And it's also possible for a matter to start as an arbitration and then the parties opt out of the arbitration and decide to proceed to mediation. Thank you very much. Wow. Well, I think we must be saying that uh, this has been a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful mentorship, mentorship session. Uh, quite a lot that uh, we've been able to uh, just uh, uh, get in, uh, get, uh, get in fr uh, from, from you. And uh, thank you very much uh, for your time and also for the very good coverage of uh, the advanced skills in, um, in arbitration. Uh, now, we have a question and um, uh, or probably a, a comment, and I think this may just be worth um, us um, having very clearly. Um, arbitration seems to be very much about procedure. procedure. And uh, when it comes to uh, mediation, it's they, there seems to be flexibility for the parties. Could you um, uh, just highlight that to us a bit with regard to the the aspect of mediation? Yes, having flexibility and arbitration seems to be about procedure. You know, as there's a seat, uh, there it needs to be written, and you know, just to just to give us a a, a distinction or just uh, the clarity on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Angari, for that. Uh, indeed, you're right that uh, arbitration proceeds more like the court, the court process. Uh, even in terms of uh, even the way the parties present their matters, you'll find that to a very large extent, uh, they follow largely like the rules around used in the court process. Uh, in terms of the way evidence is uh, presented, it usually have to tie in, for example with the provisions of the Evidence Act. So for example, if it's uh, maybe things like hearsay evidence, the rules of evidence on admission of hearsay evidence, for example, would uh, be taken into consideration. Uh, the way the pleadings are prepared in arbitration would usually be very much the way you'd find pleadings in court. <laughs> And usually the reason for this is because a lot of the times the parties are represented by their advocates. So a lot of times they will use the same uh, procedures. You'll find that uh, in arbitration, the parties would even set out, you know, legal authorities to support their case. So they would cite cases on which the arbitrator will have to make a determination on whether that actually case uh, can support the position being advanced by a party, the other party, could of course challenge the particular legal authority that has been presented by one party and the arbitrator therefore has to draw a distinction, for example, between the legal authorities that have been cited by the parties and make a determination on what would apply. So to that extent, therefore, arbitration tends to proceed very much along the lines of court procedures. And therefore, even in terms of the steps, you know, uh, you know, like uh, you, the, the 
the, the, the presentation of the statement of claim, the defense, the reply to the defense, the cross-examination, the re-examination, the examination in chief, all those issues are basically what you'd actually find in a court of law. So it's true, it's a very procedural step. On the other hand, I think uh, mediation by its nature uh, is actually a process that seeks to ensure that the parties own the settlement that they agree or come or arrive at. And so to that extent, it is uh, in a sense a bit more informal because you're actually trying to help the parties come to a formal settlement or the issues around them. And therefore, uh, to, to enable that, you have to make sure that uh, it's not so much tied up to rules and procedures. And I think that's one of the things that has made mediation a very uh, attractive form of settlement because even where you have advocates in mediation, their role is uh, fairly uh, you know, limited as compared to, uh, to arbitration, where in arbitration, it is actually the advocates if they're there who actually present the case of their, uh, of their parties. In mediation, the advocates are only there to provide advice to their parties, maybe on various issues that could arise, maybe even on the settlement, whether they can sign onto the settlement or not, whether they are, you know, the advocates basically is there to advise. But the actual decision and the active participation is by the parties themselves, the parties in the, in the, in the dispute. So I would therefore say that uh, to that extent, it is a lot more informal and in a sense, it empowers the parties a lot more as compared to arbitration. Thank you, thank you very much for that, um, uh, for that uh, 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 or, or reinforcement of the message. Um, we have uh, two, two, or two, or two questions or comments that we will take, and then we can be able to uh, close in the session. So uh, yes, uh, we, yeah, th thank you, uh, uh, Kishinga. The session has provided clarity on arbitration and mediation. Um, so there's a question on at what point is unsworn evidence provided? Oh, thank you. Uh, basically, as I said, the parties are at liberty to decide uh, on how they wish to provide their evidence before the tribunal. So at the time when uh, uh, the evidence now is called in an oral hearing, the parties would usually be uh, asked whether they want to give sworn evidence or unsworn evidence. And uh, essentially then the parties do elect how they want to uh, provide their evidence to the tribunal. So. Uh, this would usually be at that point of, uh, at the interlocutory stage, once that is concluded, then when it comes to the presentation of uh, the evidence before the tribunal in the oral hearing, then the parties would actually make a, a determination or a choice as to how they want the evidence to be presented to the uh, tribunal. Okay, thank, thank you for that uh, uh, clarification. Then uh, we have the, uh, just the uh, general question that is um, on uh, what are common general errors in arbitration to watch out for? Um, this is either by arbitrators, by the clients or client advisors, and also by the witnesses or expert witnesses. You may probably just summarize what are just some of the things that may be important. I believe like for instance, uh, there you highlighted earlier, the aspect that the seat of the arbitration is, uh, is important that it's declared. Uh, you also highlighted that uh, you know, the documents uh, should be signed off. It should also be in writing. Uh, there are probably maybe like uh, some other two or just three uh, general uh, errors that could be there that may make the, the award either not hold or then it becomes subject to appeal because we've, we've seen that um, the sub arbitration awards being appealed and yet uh, you did indicate that uh, the arbitrator is more or less sitting um, as a, just as um, a judge of the high court. Thank you. 
Okay, Th thank you for that question. Uh, obviously, there, there could be some mistakes that uh, could occur and which could uh, present challenges and maybe even render the award unenforceable. Uh, some of the common mistakes that could happen is that uh, there could be mistakes that can be corrected. So for example, an arbitrator could make uh, a determination but makes what you call an error on the face of record. So for example, maybe it's in terms of computing the amount to be paid to a party, maybe in terms of the actual addition, uh, he can end up making a mistake. Uh, so maybe he says a party is supposed to entitled for ABC, he's supposed to be paid maybe 100,000 shillings, but really, uh, there's something he has missed out and maybe the amount should have been 150,000. Th those are things that are called uh, errors on the face of the record and uh, can be uh, corrected because as it stands, uh, it would already be a problem. Maybe he has, he has even given a higher amount than what actually the total tally is to. So maybe I said 150,000 rather than 100,000 and therefore you cannot enforce the 100,000. So those kind of mistakes can be corrected, but they are corrected by an application being made to the High Court, and then the High Court judicially asks the arbitrator to revisit his arbitration and look at those issues. The other common mistake that can happen is that uh, where the party, uh, where the arbitrator was supposed to make a finding, let's say on six issues, maybe he makes a finding on four issues and leaves out two issues. So in other words, he fails to make a determination on all the issues that were presented before him or her. In that particular case, again, uh, uh, that there'll be a problem with enforcement because we'll be saying that arbitration is incomplete or the award is incomplete. And uh, again, a party can make an application to the High Court and the High Court can revert that particular issue to the arbitrator and ask him to make a finding on the pending issues. The other uh, problem that could arise is that maybe this is a matter that cannot be arbitrated. For example, you cannot arbitrate over a criminal matter. Those matters are not arbitrate, uh, cannot be arbitrated. And so if for any reason the arbitrator actually decides to proceed with uh, an arbitration uh, between a conflict, maybe between uh, two persons or two families on a criminal matter, uh, then obviously uh, that cannot uh, stand and it, it, will not proceed, it will not be honored. Then obviously the other issue would be if the arbitrator, for example, is, has an undeclared conflict of interest. Uh, if at any point it becomes obvious that in fact there was uh, such a conflict of interest which was undeclared and which is material enough to influence his award, then again, the, an, an application can be set to set aside that particular uh, award. Then obviously, uh, an arbitration can only proceed on the basis that the parties have agreed or consented to an arbitration, usually by having had an arbitration clause. So if the contract between the parties did not recognize arbitration as one of the ways in which the parties can arbitrate, and the parties themselves have not subsequent to that contract agreed to have a clause that allows them to arbitrate, then the arbitrator would have no jurisdiction to undertake arbitration. And then maybe the last one I would like to highlight is that just on the grounds of public policy, there could be certain would not really allow to be the subject of arbit policies, should not promote, you know, things that uh, you know deal with immorality for example maybe things that are prohibited by law on moral or ethical grounds for instance and then uh, if you uh, arbitrate on a matter that would fall within uh, this kind of uh, area then uh, that particular award can be challenged on the grounds that it offends public policy and is not a matter that should be the subject of an arbitration. So those could be some of the areas. Thank you. Uh, we yes, uh, thank you, thank you for that um, highlight on the errors. I believe it's uh, very important that uh, they are uh, put on the 
um, on the on the on the on the face of the practitioners, just so that uh, then practitioners can be very very alert. Eh? Um, we have one question, uh, and uh, the question is um, arbitration or a comment. Arbitration is used uh, commonly in uh, the area of uh, business disputes. And um, the question is, um, do the business executives, and so when we are talking about the business executives, these are chief executive officers, the chief finance officers, and also like public relation officers, do they understand how arbitration works? Uh, then uh, uh, is it an effective um, mechanism for uh, micro, small and medium enterprises? Also the question whether do they participate in the sessions? Now we're talking about now the chief executive officers and the finance teams. Now here presuming uh, like if um, the matter is of a, either a high or substantial monetary value or it has a, a, public, a public profile um, the, uh, issue that could affect the company. Then um, the other aspect of that is uh, so how can the conflict transformation mediators and the practitioners uh, who are uh, mediators and who are uh, the intention is that conflict can be transformed at the business level. How can they support these uh, executives to be able to participate more um, effectively? Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, first of all, to note that to a very large extent, uh, arbitration initially tends to apply in uh, commercial matters. So yes, uh, uh, matters that involve, for example, micro and small, medium enterprises, informal businesses, uh, all these matters can be arbitrated. The important thing is that uh, the parties have agreed or consented to an arbitration in terms of the contractual uh, arrangement that they have between themselves. In terms of uh, whether uh, some of the key officials, let's say within companies, would actually understand or do understand arbitration, I would say yes, they do, uh, because uh, one ordinarily they would be uh, have sight of the various agreements that they enter into within the, their establishments, and uh, they would therefore be aware that maybe in terms of conflict, that there is a way in which this particular conflict could be resolved, and maybe one of the elements or one of the ways to do this would be through arbitration. So yes, a lot of times uh, uh, people would understand. What people might not understand is the way uh, arbitration works. Uh, people a lot of times uh, might think that arbitration is a fairly informal process, only to be surprised that in fact, it is even very, very difficult to appeal a finding by an arbitrator and that effectively an arbitration is a court process so to speak. It's a court process outside the courtrooms. Uh, and that's one of the areas where a lot of people actually don't understand how serious uh, arbitration is in terms of uh, its possible consequences. And then uh, in terms of how people involved in conflict resolution can assist, uh, I, I think uh, the way they can assist is uh, to make sure that the key principles around conflict resolution are better understood, particularly by those who are charged with uh, finding a way of resolving disputes. Because at the end of the day, the principles cut across. Uh, basically, the principles uh, would cut across in the sense that you should try as much as possible, find ways of resolving disputes before they mutate to an extent that they have, for example, to go to arbitration. Uh, and if you go to an arbitration forum, that uh, it's important to cooperate to make sure that you provide uh, your evidence uh, as much as possible within the timelines that are set, so that then the tribunal itself is better facilitated to comprehensively address all the issues before, before the tribunal. It tends to happen that a lot of times some parties imagine that if they do not cooperate with the, with the tribunal, that the matter can actually be brought to an end or to a close, and that they can frustrate the tribunal, not knowing that in fact the tribunal will just proceed on the basis of the evidence before it and can make a determination that is not in favor of the party that is not cooperating. 
uh, because it's denied the opportunity to understand their case. So yes, they can assist in that particular regard. Thank you. Thank you so much. I believe that now we are at the uh, closing section of our discussion today. This has been a very, very uh, uh, useful and also quite a well elaborated session that we've been able to have for the colleagues who have been uh, on the session. We trust that uh, you have been able to get a lot of value with uh, the session um, today. So uh, today's session uh, was our uh, Women's Edge uh, mentorship session, which is uh, a session which is run as part of the uh, fellowship program that uh, we have. At, and this is a five, the five months uh, fellowship national certificate that is for uh, mediators in Kenya. And um, as part of the fellowship certificate, then uh, we have the uh, uh, session mentors, or we have sessions which we have mentorship, and this is one of them. And uh, this session that we have today is our, our session on uh, the area of uh, advanced arbitration 101 skills. And uh, this has been with our fellowship coach and the session mentor, Gishinga Dirango, who is an, an arbitration tutor. And we thank him for walking us through this particular session. So with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we shall close our session with the words of the Kenyan national anthem. And so that then we can be able to now prepare for the next uh, session that will be taking off at 10 a.m. today, which is the fellowship hangout. And we look forward to be able to hang out together as uh, fellows. I will guide with the first stanza of the Kenyan national anthem in English. Oh God of all creation, bless this our land and nation. Justice be our shield and defender. May we dwell in unity, peace and liberty, plenty be found within our borders. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for taking the time to be with us and may you have a blessed day ahead. Asante sana, Coach Kishinga, and for the fellows in this session, God bless you. With that, we say goodbye and thank you for joining us for the fellowship mentorship as part of the Women's Edge, a skills mentorship hour as part of the five months fellowship national certificate during the virtual personal development coaching course 2021 for mediators in Kenya. At Santisana and uh, God bless you. Have a pleasant weekend. <laughs>